speaker for the afternoon is my good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Jeff Quinn. And Jeff is, is the Vice President for College Relations. He's also Assistant Professor for Pastoral Ministries here at Nia College and Alliance Theological Seminary. I asked Jeff how long has he been here, and he said a long time. It's uh, over three decades that he's been part of NIAC, and he has taught classes. In fact, <laughs> my very first class <laughs> with NIAC was taught by this gentleman, and it made uh, an indelible impression upon me. I, to be honest with you, I took the class, and I said, if, if this works, if this seems to work for me, maybe I'll plug into NIAC, and the rest is history. That course set the trajectory for me. Um, he's taught preaching, pastoral leadership, and just a bunch of other things. He's a graduate of Naya College and of Columbia University. Uh, he's presently a doctoral candidate in our uh, Doctor of Ministry program here at Alliance Theological Seminary. Jeff and his wife Darlene live in Warwick, New York. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Jeff Peck. Charles, thank you, my dear friend, who I've known for a long, long time who had grace enough to continue with NIAC, even though you started with a class that I taught. Uh, it is a privilege for me to be here tonight. It really is. This is one of the great uh, privileges. It's one of the perks of my work at NIAC is that uh, I don't get to interact with students on a daily basis, so when I get a chance to spend time with you, especially in this setting, it is really a blessing. For those of you who led worship, thank you for uh, ministering to us already. Anything that I will bring will just be gravy, as we say, right? So thank you for that. Hey, I believe that God is going to bless you this evening. Yes. I do. I, I believe that this is the place that you are supposed to be, okay? And so anything that you have perhaps sacrificed or anything that you have, have had to forestall so that you could be here, I believe God's going to honor that. We don't earn what God does for us. I'm not saying that. But I believe that God loves it when we trust him enough to put ourselves in a position for him to reach us. And, and so that short distance for on the elevator, which some days isn't a short distance, I know, but that short distance on the elevator that brought you here was an important distance. And I just want to declare that I believe God's going to do something in our midst this evening that's going to make this time very worthwhile. I also want to declare that there are probably people in your spheres of influence who God wants to do something for them here, but alas, they're, they're not here. So we're going to function like the church, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to invite them to come. What a novel idea. We're going to invite classmates Amen. to come. Now, I'm not asking you to overhype what happens tonight, but if God blesses you, through the music, which probably already happened. Or if God, in his grace, should bless you through the, the, the ministry of the word, would you go tell somebody? Would you go tell somebody? Because here's what I know is going to happen. We're going to get into the part of the semester where it gets a little steep. Have you, have you noticed that we're kind of getting to that point? So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against term papers, not against time crunches, but so we wrestle against an enemy and against forces that the place where we defeat them is here, and we're not alone in that. So there are folks in your classes that need to be here that perhaps will come if you say, hey, come with me to chapel. Sit by, I'll sit by you. You sit by me. It was, last week I went. It was good. There was an old guy preaching, and a couple of things made sense. It was good. I think that that can be important in our community. So consider that. For That's not even what I came to preach about. But consider that, if you would. And before we go any further, let's just, let's just approach God and ask him to uh, open us up a little bit this evening so we can receive what he has for us. Uh, you are a good, good father. You're a father who does exceedingly more than we even know to ask or imagine. And Lord, sometimes in our need, we can imagine a lot. You do more. So remind us of that, I pray. Teach us to turn to you, even in those moments when in fear or anxiety or deep concern, 
we would tend not to, to turn to you. Teach us to turn to you. Make our responses helpful responses. And for that, we will thank you and use our time together, Lord, to direct us properly, I pray. Thank you for being here. We don't have to shout to a distant God. We just have to listen to a God who's whispering in our ear. Give us ears to hear this evening to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, lots to cover tonight. We're going to try to be efficient but not rushed. But I do want to start with a couple of questions and then a story. How many of you have ever felt fear or anxiety? Raise your hand. Okay. And for those of you who didn't raise your hand, I think you were just afraid to raise your hand. So you're included. Right? Sure. Now, here's really what I want to talk about. How many of you, in a moment of fear or anxiety, have responded in a way that made the situation worse? Raise your hand. Okay. Me too. Now, I want to tell a story that I might have even told in chapel before. I, I don't have that interesting a life, so I don't have that many interesting stories. This one isn't about a time that I responded poorly. It's about a time that I almost responded poorly. You see, what was happening was my family was on vacation at the beach in North Carolina. And I was out in the ocean on a Thursday afternoon. It's Thursday night. It was a Thursday then. I remember it very, very well. And I was in water in the ocean off the outer banks of North Carolina, up to my shoulders, okay? And I was just kind of not paying attention, looking around, enjoying myself. And I looked off to the right, and without warning, probably about where my, my, my brother is who played the keyboard, not that far away from me, I saw a fin cut the water. I kid you not. Yeah. It's one of the few times in my life that Every part of my body was afraid. <laughs> my entire body was just went rigid because I did not expect that. I did not welcome that. <laughs> and I thought, what's going to happen to me now? Because all I saw was the fin come up and go down, and then I saw the waves go up, and then I didn't see anything, and that was the worst part. <laughs> wow. But with music playing my, in my head, you, exactly, that music. I started to kind of do my own version of a moonwalk back to the beach. And praise the Lord, I got safely up onto the shore. But that's when the dilemma hit. Because I, I looked out and I saw all of these southerners, it was North Carolina, still playing and bobbing around in the water. And from at that moment, they looked like hors d'oeuvres. Right? And I wondered, what do I do? I was afraid for them. And I wondered, should I run down the beach like the sheriff in Jaws, yelling, shark, shark? And fortunately, as my Baptist friends would say, I had a check in my spirit. Right? I had a check in my spirit. Don't do that. Thank you, Lord. So I didn't know what to do. And I did know that my wife was safely up on a beach blanket reading, because she's the smart one. And so I, I went to her to say, well, well, here's what happened, what do I do? When she looked past me, I said, look, a dolphin. And I looked. And by that point, people in the water are looking and pointing and clapping and smiling, not the response I had had, because what was clearly going on was that there was a dolphin, not just one dolphin, but a mama dolphin and her little baby dolphin. It was just adorable. And they're happy. And that was not the scene that was going on in my head just a moment ago. Now, what would have happened <clears throat> had I given in to that initial response of running down the beach yelling, shark, shark? I would have started the stampede. Probably somebody would have gotten trampled. And then when everybody got up to see a dolphin, I would have had a problem. I didn't do that. I'm at occasion. But there have been other occasions when my response has not been productive. In fact, it's been very counterproductive. It's been unproductive or sometimes worse. It's been, it's been harmful when my response to fear hasn't been a good response. I want to share with us a story from the Old Testament, a story of a king whose name you may know, but whose story you might not. 
a king named Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's story is found in 2 Chronicles 21. We're going to walk through elements of his story. Jehoshaphat's story starts like this. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Meunites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. After this is such a loaded little phrase, but what's going on is, is this. Is this. Jehoshaphat's been trying to do the right thing. Right? He made a big mistake because he aligned with evil King Ahab. God punished him by causing him to have a disastrous outcome in a battle. Jehoshaphat almost lost his life. Got out of the battle barely, but then a prophet named Jehu came to him and, and uh, uh, confronted him about his decision. And Jehoshaphat repented and went about the work of trying to restore justice and do the things that God had told him to do throughout the land. He reinstated the judges. Man, the guy was working hard. Isn't that interesting? A lot of times after we've done the right thing, we think after we've done the right thing, we're going to have that time of peace and quiet. Hey, I, Lord, I did the right thing, so things are going to go okay for me, right? You know what we forget? We forget that we have an enemy. We forget that we have an enemy who notices when we do the right thing. And when we do the right thing, and our enemy decides that he doesn't like that we do the right thing, that's the prime time for him to come after us. And I believe that's exactly what was happening in the life of Jehoshaphat. There's a reason why I want to tell Jehoshaphat's story. Jehoshaphat was a good king, but historians wouldn't call him a great king. Because he had those inconsistencies. He had those moments when seeking after national security, he would compromise things that God had told him to do or not to do. And he would compromise because of the pressure of his role. And there's somebody that that reminds me of. Me. And maybe you. Right? We're, we're ordinary people who sometimes get placed in extraordinary roles. And you're saying, well, hey, last time I checked, I wasn't the king. True, me either. But we're still ordinary people who get placed in extraordinary roles. Some of you might be dads or moms. Those are extraordinary roles. And if you're not that now, someday perhaps, husband, Wife, it's an extraordinary role. Stop and think about it. Friend, that's an extraordinary role. Some of you are pastors. That's an extraordinary role. And you feel the weight of being an ordinary person thrust into an extraordinary role. And you realize, wow. Sometimes that equation doesn't feel like it adds up. Jehoshaphat felt that. And one of the places where he felt this was this very moment when these nation states in and around his part of the divided kingdom, and I won't go into all of that, but he was the king of Judah, and his nation was surrounded by people who wanted to overthrow this little country, plunder its resources, and take its people off into slavery. Because that's what they did back then. Jehoshaphat felt the weight of that, and he felt fear. Now, it is right for us to sing that there is not a reason for us to be afraid. It is right for us to sing that. But I don't know about you, a lifetime of singing that there really isn't a reason for me to be afraid has not yet cured me of being afraid. Okay? I'm still in process. So with that being the case, it's helpful for me to think through what are responses that I have when fear comes my way. It's interesting the way that fear came Jehoshaphat's way. Here, I will say. There we go. Here's how fear came Jehoshaphat's way. Some people, I love the Bible. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Now, you've got to think about this. This story has been kept alive as people told it orally for centuries. 
But even throughout that whole process, you know what they kept alive? Some people. I know some people. I've met some people. I know some people who believe it's their assignment to come to give us the news that's going to make sure we're alarmed. If you don't have problems, I know some people that you, if you just talk to them, they'll make sure if you're without problems, you're going to get some problems. That's who some people are. I'm not talking about glass half empty people or half full people. I'm talking about completely empty glass that falls on the floor and breaks. So you step on it, cut your foot, get an infection, and die people. I'm talking about people whose blood type is B negative. Right? You know some people? couple things I've noticed about some people. Here's the first thing I noticed about some people. And it's in this passage. We know the names of everybody else in this passage. We know Jehoshaphat. In a little while, we're going to meet Jehaziel. We know the enemies, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Meunites. We know them, right? We know all the enemies. You know whose names we don't know? The some people. Yeah. Exactly. Young leaders, I want you to listen to me. If you're a young leader, I want you to listen to me. I'm an old guy. I do this every once in a while. You want you to listen to me. Don't overinvest in anonymous reports. Do not overinvest in anonymous reports. Because with anonymity, accountability disappears. I've seen it. With the anonymity that people require to sometimes work out their agenda, the accountability goes away. And here's some people. Here's the other thing I noticed. They came with the problems. The Bible does not record that they came with any solutions. If you want to know who to have on your team and who to maybe not have on your team, keep track of how many problems they point to versus how many solutions they point to. Right? Because if you're going to enjoy the benefit of being on a team, especially if you have a leadership role, you have to take up the work of contributing to that team. And pointing to some answers is part of the work by which people whose names aren't known contribute to the team. Some people weren't doing that. But here's the other thing. They were the first to be forgotten, apparently, because their names don't show up. Think about that if, in fact, without letting anybody know, you have to confront the fact that right now you either have been or sometimes are in the some people's group. You want a reason not to be. Their names don't continue. And I know we're not in this for glory, but the first forgotten were the ones who tried to work and function in anonymity. I don't want to get bogged down there, but I think it's worth watching that some people came and told him this. And the next words in this account demonstrate that Jehoshaphat was alarmed. Some people just like to spread alarm. So what happens when we're alarmed? Well, we're going to have some kind of response, right? So I've written down a few responses to being alarmed, to fear or anxiety that I want us to look at. I want to talk about three unresponsive, excuse me, unproductive responses to fear. Three unproductive responses to fear. Here's the first. It's the freak out. I called a friend of mine. <laughs> this was actually longer ago than I thought it was. Hey, how are you doing? He said, I'm freaking out, man. I knew exactly what he meant, because to be honest with you, I had seen him freak out before. A couple of years ago, I read this newspaper account of a guy in California. This, this, the, the, this is true. Whether the account is true, I don't know, but I saw it in a newspaper. He did about $40,000 worth of damage to his friend's apartment because he tried to get rid of a spider with a blowtorch. He tried to get rid of a spider with a blowtorch and about burned his friend's place to the ground. Friends, that's a freak out. Now, that's a kind of a funny account, not if it was your apartment. But if we stop and think about it, people have different kinds of blowtorches, don't they? I mean, maybe the blowtorch is, is, is anger. Right? 
maybe the, maybe the, the blowtorch is, is some sort of retaliation. Uh, I've seen some of these blowtorches get get pretty fiery uh, in the freak out. That's an unproductive response to fear. My question to you is to face some of the fears that come our way. Are we freaking out a little bit? There, there's another uh, response that's unproductive. That's kind of the check out. I, when I'm not paying attention, sometimes I have to confess usually to my wife. Uh, I'm sorry, hi, I checked out there. I mean, what it is, you create some, some distance by just sort of going to someplace else. Uh, the problem is that some people, when they encounter fear, what they do is they just check out. They don't engage a situation anymore. They don't connect to the thing. They're, they're just checked out. Folks, I've, I've seen folks in this context, class gets hard, check out. Don't check out. Just reading the text. <laughs> the checkout's not productive. It's not, not a productive response to fear. I gotta, I've got to ask you: is there, is there something that's making you check out a little bit? I have to. I have to say, it's not a productive response. It could be a harmful response over time. The third is sneaky. The third unproductive response. I call that the leak out. And what it is is that it's either a freak out or a check out that rather than show up in this situation over here, it shows up someplace completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. You get some anger, some pain, some frustration, some fear, and fear will cause those things, and it just sort of leaks out over here on somebody else. It's the leaked out. It doesn't mean you come all at once, but it does leave some very confused individuals you wonder, what just happened? How did that happen? I've been guilty of doing that to, to people, <laughs> innocent bystanders who I love dearly are in my life. I said I leaked out on them. Well, those are un unproductive responses, and maybe you notice some of those. Um, I'd like to walk through Jehoshaphat's story, because quickly, uh, I think he's going to show us five productive responses. These are productive, helpful responses. And before I go further, I do want to say, I don't believe I'm giving you a formula by which you call down a miracle. I don't think that's the way we want to look at this. And the reason is God is God. And, and he's going to decide how and when and where his power is dispensed. Now that should not cause us to doubt his power, but that should cause us to respect his sovereignty. Still, productive responses beat the freak out, or the check out, or the leak out. And Jehoshaphat, this ordinary guy in an extraordinary role, demonstrated these five responses that were helpful for you to remember. Here's the first thing Jehoshaphat did, and that we can do when we face fear. Jehoshaphat reminds you, seek your God. Seek your God. The word says alarmed, because some people did that. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. Now, that, that word that we've translated, resolved to inquire of the Lord, is fascinating. The Hebrew word is derash. And what it means is that he abided or he dwelled in a place with God. There's a deli that I stop at most mornings to get coffee. You could say, I derash Haywood's Deli. I go there consistently, and I am bodily there. That's the image I want you to take with you. Seek your God isn't just, I'm looking to see if God showed up yet. No. Seek your God is put yourself in the place where you know he is. That's what you're doing this evening. That's why I'm saying there's other people who need to be here. You're putting yourself in a place where you know God is because he does inhabit the praises of his people. This is a productive response to fear. He, that's what Jehoshaphat did. He sought God. He went to the place where he knew God would be. In our lives, 
don't we have those places where for us experientially, not theologically, just experientially for a moment, we know in a sense where God is and where he is in our lives, right? We know the place where we're going to connect with God. We're going to encounter him. But when fear arises, those are the places to be. Jehoshaphat proved it. Seek the God. Are you seeking him? Seriously, right now, if there's something causing fear or anxiety that you would have to respond to, does your response include a derash with God? Jehoshaphat would urge you to do so. Here's a second. Secondly, strengthen your team. We don't think about this very often, particularly in our culture, because we tend to be isolated. But I want you to look at what Jehoshaphat did. He proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. They came together. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat took this from an isolated individual responsibility to a community event. Folks, you are blessed with community here. I hope you know that. You will not have to look hard to find people who know you and who care about you. And if you begin to talk about the things that concern you, you will find people who will listen. You may not find people who can simply make the problem go away. But you will find people who will carry the load with you. Do not face fear alone. Because our enemy loves it when we try to do that. Loves people who are isolated. Because what he'll do is he'll start telling his lies, playing his game. And the problem becomes the problem. Because there's nobody to tell you otherwise. Seek your God and strengthen your team. Do not do this in isolation. Jehoshaphat didn't. And the results will speak for themselves. Here's a third. Speak your faith. This is such an important one that I got, I got three sections of scripture for it. Speak your faith. In the middle of this fear event, I want to ask you, what are you saying? Listen to what you're saying. If somebody was to record you, would that recording sound like, oh, this is such a problem. I got such a problem. This is going to go so bad now. Oh, my goodness. Would it be just that over and over and over? Compare that with what Jehoshaphat prayed. Lord God of our ancestors, are you not the king who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. The first thing Jehoshaphat spoke in his faith was who God is. Folks, that's the first thing your enemy wants you to forget in a time of fear. He wants you to forget who God is. He wants to obscure your understanding of God with the blockade of the thing that makes you afraid. <laughs> Don't let him. That's the time to speak who God is. Josh that said, are you not? It's a rhetorical question because he knew that he was. This is who I know you to be, the God who is in heaven, who rules over all the nations, including these jokers that are coming our way spoke about who God is. The second thing he spoke was, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? After you talk about who God is, begin to talk about what he has done. What has he done? We could have a prayer meeting that would go to next Tuesday in this room if we start talking about all the things that God has already done for us. How would that change our perspective if those were the things that we started to talk about the next time we have to respond to fear? I'm afraid. But I remember a time. I remember a time when it looked worse than this. And here's what my God did. Here's what he provided. Here's how he healed. Here's how he restored. Jehoshaphat did. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. God, you've done this. And I remember. I'm going to talk about who you are. And then I'm going to talk about what you did. And then Jehoshaphat speaks about what he knows God will do. 
oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is so important in the sequence because there is part of this prayer that many people are quick to pray. It's this part. We have no power and we don't know what to do. That's the part we jump to. Oh, we're powerless. I need to be empowered. I need to know what to do. You know, in context, that's a confession before your father. Out of context, that's a defeatist attitude. Right? Because when you've already said, here's who you are. Here's what you've done. Now, you know what? Here's what I don't bring to the table, and that's okay. Because of who you are and what you've done. We don't know what to do, but won't you judge them? <coughs> won't you act consistently with your loving character and who you are? Seek your God. Strengthen your team. Speak your faith. Begin to declare it. It matters. Not to persuade God about you. Rather to persuade you about God. Yeah, that's good. It is good. And it's important to remember. Here's the fourth thing that Jehoshaphat did. I like this one. Seize hold of your answer. A guy named Jehaziel becomes filled with the Holy Spirit in the middle of this praise time, this prayer time, and he begins to prophesy. And here's the prophecy he gives. You won't even have to fight this battle. It's in this context. It's one of the places where we see the battle belongs to the Lord. That's what we see. This is one of the places in the Old Testament where that's made clear. Take up your position, stand firm, and just watch the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his face to the ground. If you've got an enemy coming your way, and you're taking the time to thank God for the answer you've already gotten, you have seized hold of your answer. Let me ask you the question. In the middle of your fear, are you frantic? Or are you praising? Are you worshiping or worrying? Jehoshaphat has faced the ground. So that's the answer. I saw. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little slow to seize hold of my answer. Lord, would you please provide? And somebody comes and says, I believe God's already provided. I think that I really believe this. Thank you. Oh, Lord, would you please provide? Joshua had the discernment to grab onto his answer and say, I don't, I don't want to need to be told once. I don't want to need to be told once. And I'm going to worship you now, not just for who you are and what you've done, but for what you are doing in the midst. I receive that. I accept that. I believe in my gut right now that this is for some of you here. If your answer's there, do you seize it? That promise has been made by the creator of heaven and earth. Will you believe it? You've been redefined. Do you acknowledge it? Believe it. Seize your answer. It's there for you. Last one. Sing your victory. I don't sing well, but I think God likes it when he hears me sing victory that he's given. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. He appointed men to sing to the Lord. Man's choir. Put together a men's choir to sing to the Lord, to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Hey, these are some faithful musicians. Can you imagine you know, Dean Hammond, hey, singers, I got a great, great plan. We're going to go face an overwhelming hostile force and what I want to do is choir, you're in front. Those are some faithful musicians, aren't they? They had to have something going on because they believed it, and they just went and they sang their victory. We sing other songs too often, don't we? Right? We sing those other songs. 
sing the, the, the dirges, the, the morning sad songs. I mean, you know, some of us sound like perpetual country music stations. <laughs> How bad it's going to be. Not John's bad. When he seized his answer, he began to sing. You know, sometimes we have to sing before the battle. Sometimes we have to sing about the victory before the battle's fought. Why? Because it aligns us with what God's going to do. Can I prompt you to maybe sing that song this evening? Could that be one of your responses? Well, true to what Jehaziel had said, here's what happened. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. What had happened was that they could never have known. This was before the days of cable news. That alliance between the Moabites and the Ammonites, all that alliance dissolved. They didn't trust each other to begin with. And it didn't take much of a spark for that to explode into an ambush set by one against the other, and they just literally devoured each other. The same bloodthirst that caused them to come against the nation of Judah, turned them against each other. And God used this to deliver his people. No one could have seen that coming. Can I dare to say that there are answers awaiting some of you that no one could have ever seen coming? No one can predict it. It's not trend line. Right? It's this. Because that's what demonstrates power of God. And that's what really gives us something to sing about. Responses to fear. Here's, what our, here's our, our takeaway. I want you to remember this. What we do with our fear determines what our fear does with us. What we do with our fear determines what our fear does with us. Jehoshaphat would urge you, here's what you do with your fear. Seek your God. Dwell with him. So you get a picture of what he's doing. Seek your God. Strengthen your king. Don't face your fear alone. There's no reason to. It's going to put you in a vulnerable place. Speak your faith. Make sure you are declaring who God is and what he has done. And it positions you to begin to talk about what it is he's going to do. Speak your faith. Finally, or fourth, seize hold of your answer. There are so many places in Scripture where the, the means of deliverance is so unpredictable that you really have to be creative to begin to see it. But once you begin to see it, grab onto it and act on it. Let's pray. Sing with your faith. God loves the praise of the people who are still in the battle. And he's one of those when they face fear. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. Can we give, give you a moment to respond? I, I believe that if you look at your response to whatever might give you fear or anxiety, you'd have to say, hmm, I'm, I'm not responding like Jehoshaphat. So I'm just going to invite you to speak to God this evening. I'm going to invite you to say, Lord, it's time for me to begin to do one of these things. Maybe you need to seek him. Maybe you need to strengthen your team. Maybe it is you need to speak out your faith or seize hold of your answer. Or maybe you need to sing your victory. This is the moment to say, Lord, help me to do it. Because I'm, I'm promising right now. That's what I'm going to try to do. Would you say that to him? He'll hear you. He'll take that prayer very seriously. He will hear you. And he will respond. What we do with our fear determines what our fear will do with us. My prayer for you is that like Jehoshaphat, that would lead you to tremendous, tremendous victory. Lord Jesus, thank you for walking with us in the times in our lives where things become fearsome. Yet we can respond this way because if we know, because we know of who you are, and we know all this is true. Remind us, Lord, of the victories you have already won so that we can sing in the victories that are to come. I pray this for all of these folks here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.